Well, good morning, good morning. It's good to see everyone this morning. Would you please stand and let's worship the Lord Jesus Christ, singing a song, Celebrate Jesus Celebrate. Here we go. Let's sing. Celebrate Jesus Celebrate. announcements by Sister Carol. Good morning. Good to be back. Missed you last week. Thank you. Thank you. Want to remind you of some things. Uh, tonight, you want to be sure, if you enjoy Sunday nights, and we all do, you get an opportunity to ask questions and participate and have some good teaching as well. You want to be sure and come tonight because for the next three Sunday nights, we're not going to be here. We're going to be other places. So be sure and be here tonight, six o'clock, so you don't miss the teaching. And uh, we are finishing our Edna McMillan offering. If you haven't given your money, we've met our, it exceeded our goal. Thank you for being faithful. Our goal was 500 and we've we've received 521. If you still wanted to give money, do so. That still goes to all of these projects and many more, including disaster relief, and we're all uh, big fans of that, so to speak, that work. So go ahead and give this morning. Be sure it goes in the right envelope so we'll know where the money's going. So you can still give toward that if you want to, but thank you for all of those that gave already. Sunday, uh, next Sunday, next Sunday night, we're going to go to uh, we're, re we're canceling our services, and we're going to have our services at the Oklahoma Worship Choir at Moore. We're going to go to hear them. So uh, Moore First Baptist Church in Moore, we're going to go and hear them. There's a sign-up list in the foyer. We're going to have a carpool that will leave here at 5 o'clock. So if you plan to go, be here before 5 o'clock so we can leave at 5 o'clock. So ne that's next Sunday night. Then the following Sunday night, October the 9th, we're going to replace our worship service with the annual meeting of the Capital Baptist Association, and it will be at Trinity Baptist Church in Oklahoma City. There's some special speakers, and you can pull on one of these flyers to see who they're going to be and read about them, and that should be a really interesting time. So be sure and sign up for that too, because we'll, I'm assuming have a carpool for that as well. So be sure and sign up if you plan to go. Um, there's a note in here about the family of Philmon Taylor. Would like to thank you for all the cards that uh, he passed away. And uh, some of you may have known him. I didn't know him, but anyhow, keep the family in, in your prayers. Pardon? Oh, that's right. That, that's, that's a she. I'm sorry. That's Barbara's mother. Yes, I apologize. Anyhow, thank you for all of the attention that we gave that family and the love that you showed. Okay, we'll now have our video. Now, 
Now, when we think about the word evangelist, we often think about someone like a Billy Graham or one of our favorite preachers who's packing out stadiums. Or maybe we have some negative thoughts about the guy on the street corners who's yelling at people. But the word evangelist simply means someone who's bringing good news. In fact, the word evangelist is used to describe a man in the New Testament by the name of Philip. Now, Philip was not one of the apostles. He was someone who was just serving and volunteering in his church. Now, as he's being faithful, we read in Acts chapter 8 that God intervenes. And God sees Philip's faithfulness and he allows him to go and proclaim the gospel to someone of great influence. And this person was uh, a leader in Ethiopian. It's the story of the Ethiopian eunuch, someone who worked for the queen. Now, by this providence of God, Philip hears this Ethiopian person reading from Isaiah chapter 53. Philip was ready because he was being faithful, serving God. And he began with that very passage and began to articulate the truth about Jesus Christ. This man was converted and he believed in Jesus and Philip baptized him. We later see that this man, Philip, has four daughters and they're unmarried. And the Bible says that they also prophesied so that these women were single, they weren't married, and God is using them to do the work of an evangelist. So an evangelist is not someone who necessarily has to work full-time in church. The person could be married or they could be single. They could be male or they could be female. God can use you. There's been seasons in my life in which I worked full-time in ministry, but right now I've been working in medical cells. I interact with doctors, with nurses, medical assistants, receptionists, patients who may not step foot in my church. And I have an opportunity to see them, to listen to them, and sometimes proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. God has allowed these opportunities, even while I'm presenting uh, to these patients at lunch. It's not all the time, but sometimes a conversation will come up in which a doctor or a nurse will ask a question, and I can explain to them my story, what God has done in my life. What about with you? What is your circumstance? Where has God placed you? You may think to yourself, I don't like my current job, but God can use your faithfulness in your current job to reach people who do not believe the hope of Jesus Christ. You can be an everyday evangelist, just like Philip, just like his daughters. God can use you. Let's pray. We're so thankful, Lord, for for the day that you've brought to us today. We're thankful, Lord, that, that we have this opportunity to come and worship you and praise you. We're thankful for Jesus. May we take that saving grace that is given to us outside to a dying world. Thank you for this offering today, Lord. Prepare us for the message and also prepare us today for for the Lord's Supper as we participate in this ordinance that's so important to the Christian life. Thank you for Jesus, and in his name we pray. Amen.
Amen. Sweet hour of prayer. Sweet hour of prayer that calls me from a world of care and bids me at my Father's throne make all my wants and wishes known. Let us sing that together. Sweet hour of prayer. Sweet hour of prayer. Sweet hour of prayer. Well, for our time of a congregational prayer today, is that me? I don't know if that's me or not. Uh, but for our time of congregational prayer uh, uh, today, uh, I want to remind us that uh, this month our missions uh, committee has uh, suggested and encouraged us as a church to pray for the areas that are um, uh, encouraged by our, uh, uh, by our state for our state missions offering. And those three areas have been African-American missions, refugee um, ministry, and also deaf ministry. And so today as a church, I would uh, encourage us to pray for a church right here in Oklahoma City. Uh, and I believe it's called Deaf Church Oklahoma. Uh, the pastor is uh, named Danny Bice. Uh, I've, uh, I've met him and seen him on a s a several occasions. In fact, I think he rides a motorcycle, which makes him all right, you know. But, uh, but, but, but today, let's pray for Deaf Church Oklahoma and Pastor Danny Bice. In fact, on your uh, bulletins today, there's a, a verse uh, that reminds us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Well, th well, think about the deaf community that cannot hear the Word of God. And, and what a, a blessing it is to have a pastor like Danny Bice that can sign the Word of God to them. And, and, and so let's pray for this church, for this congregation, for this pastor, and that faith might come by signing, and through sign language they might know the Word of God. And so let's uh, pray for Deaf Church, Oklahoma. I just pray for the deaf speaking to us uh, in nature and through your world. Uh, truly, we can, can hear you from the things that you have made. And we thank you for speaking to us through your word, uh, that you have inspired words that, that we can hear from you. And Father, we do pray for this, um, this uh, church, this deaf church, as well as the deaf community, Lord, that you might uh, speak to them as your word is signed before them, uh, and that, Lord, you might give them ears to hear your glorious gospel, and that, Lord, that they might walk by faith. And I pray it in Christ's name. Amen.
I'm going to ask that you would please stand as we read call to worship uh, Psalms 118, 1 through 4. Psalms 118, 1 through 4. Let us read together. Give, Give thanks, thanks to, to the Lord, Lord for, for he is good, good for, for his loving kindness is everlasting. everlasting. O oh, let Israel say, his loving kindness is everlasting. O oh, let the house of Aaron say, his loving kindness is everlasting. O oh, let those who fear the Lord say, his loving kindness is everlasting. His loving kindness is everlasting. Amen. We are one in the bond of love. 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 We have joined our spirit with the spirit of God. We are one in the bond of love. Let us sing now. Let us sing now, everyone. Let us feel his love. sing it again. We are one in the bond of love. We are one in the bond of love. We have joined our spirit with the spirit of God. We are one in the bond of love. Amen. Jesus is all the world to me. Sunshine and rain, harvest and rain, he's my friend. Jesus, Jesus is all the world to me, and true to him I'll be. Oh, how could I this friend deny when he's so true? him now. I trust him now. Life's fleeting days shall end. Beautiful life, beautiful life with such a friend. Beautiful life that has no end. Eternal life. Hope 
is found. He is my light, my strength, my song, my comforter, my all in all. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song, this cornerstone. This solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ. took on flesh, took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless, oh yes, this gift of and righteousness, scorn, scorn by the ones he came to, oh, till on that cross as Jesus the grave, up from the grave, he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since earth has lost its grip on me, for I am, for I am him, he is, he is mine, bought, bought with the precious blood of Christ. sit down that last verse when we get to that Christ I'll stand let's say we will stand okay here in the power of Christ we'll stand amen and you may be seated amen so good to hear your voices and singing and worshiping God and getting to know each other more and more it's good fellowship is important amen Amen. Today is the Lord's Supper's day, and so we chose this song for us to dedicate our spiritual singing to the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's done for us on Calvary. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. And the song says, The blood that Jesus shed for me.
gives me strength from day to day it will never lose its power church said amen it soothes my doubts and calms my fears and it drives all my tears the blood that gives me strength from day Say it one more time. The blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never lose its Uh, speaks of the blood of the eternal covenant, uh, and uh, what a what a great thing that uh, our Lord's great work in our behalf will never lose its power from now to well. There's not an end of eternity, but uh, to uh, eternity and beyond. Well, if you have your Bibles today, find the second book of the Old Testament, Exodus. We're going to read just a few verses from Exodus chapter 15, and I'm going to read verses 22 to 25. Exodus chapter 15, verses 22 to 25, and just by way of a Reminder and announcement, we usually don't hand out the sermon notes uh, when we have the, the, the Lord's Supper, but uh, they are available afterwards if, y'all, if, if you want them. Or, but, uh, but nevertheless, our, our text today is Exodus 15, and so if you have it and if you're willing and able, well, you're already standing. So let's, uh, let's listen to God's holy and inspired word from Exodus 15, beginning in verse number 22. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days into the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, it was named Marah. So the people grumbled at Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And then he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. And he threw it into the waters, and the waters became sweet. And there he made for them a statute and regulation, and there he tested them. And let's take a time to pray again. Our Father, we, uh, we thank you for who you are, that you are our great God and creator. It is you that has made us and not we ourselves. We thank you that you are our redeemer and by the power of your spirit, you have given us new life uh, for it is you that has made us and not we ourselves. And Father, as we come here to this place on this day that you have ordained that we gather, 
and praise and worship and sing together as your people and as we prepare ourselves for your holy supper. Uh, Lord, um, equip us, uh, prick us, uh, teach us, and Lord, cause us to cast our eyes upon your Son, Jesus, who is our only and eternal hope. And I pray it in his name. Amen. And you may be seated. Well, church, uh, we come here to this building today uh, in order to celebrate. Uh, we are here uh, today to, uh, to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And it is, and I believe it is a solemn celebration. There is something solemn and somber about it, but there is also something celebratory about having a meal uh, together and a meal with each other uh, that points us to the work of our Lord. But, but in saying that we are here to, to celebrate, I, I, I'm not mind, unmindful that maybe many of us have come off of a week uh, that maybe wasn't quite so wonderful for us. Uh, and maybe you don't feel quite so celebratory this morning. You know, it's just been a, one of those past weeks and you just don't feel like celebrating. Maybe you had high hopes for at the beginning of a last week, but you find yourself against the ropes now. Uh, and uh, maybe you've had that kind of a week. Or maybe that kind of a month. Or maybe that kind of a year. Uh, well, you know, life can kind of just, just be like that, can it not? Uh, oftentimes we do have big expectations of what we hope of things to be, but we wind up with big frustrations. We have cravings and we have, have a thirst for things, but our thirst is often left unquenched. And that is because all of us live in a sin-stained world. We live in a place that is cursed because of our own rebellion against our Creator. And then all of us individually have sin-stained lives that bring a, a bitterness to life. But we come here today not to deny the bitterness of life but to declare that Jesus brings a sweetness to life even amidst the bitterness. And the observance of the Lord's Supper is a powerful reminder to us. It is a dramatic reminder uh, to us of our past redemption, of something that is totally complete that the power of Christ and in his great work and his eternal blood has redeemed us. But it also comes with it a, a future promise. There is a, a promise in this supper of something that will be. Something that, that we can look forward to. Something that we only get a taste of now but we will get the full embrace of them. Our sins have been paid for and we are eternally secure and we should say eternal hallelujah. But even right now as we live in this bitter in-between of, of right now and until we get there, God has graciously given us a little bit of a taste, just a foretaste of glory divine. And, and that taste reminds us that, that there is something missing down here. And it will always be missing, but it will never be missing when we get there. And so today, as we prepare our hearts to partake of this sacred ordinance, I, I want to use this brief account that I have read from Exodus chapter 15 and use it kind of a, as an analogy of reality uh, of our Christian life. Because it, these things really happened, but they did happen to them as an examples. And I do think this is an analogy 
of our reality. And so as we prepare ourselves for the supper, I want us to remind ourselves of our situation. Uh, Let's call it for what it is, but also to remind ourselves of our Savior who redeems our situation. And this meal is to be engaged in, in remembrance and in remembrance of him. And so under three headings today, we're going to think briefly of a dry quest and of a taste test and then of a tree that gives rest. So first of all, a dry quest. Now, most of this uh, chapter, I just read a few verses from Exodus 15, but, but most of this chapter is in fact a song. Uh, In fact, almost the entirety of this chapter is a song. It is a song of deliverance in this chapter. There has been high praise and there has been a big party going on. The people of God have just been redeemed out of the land of Egypt and they just came through the Red Sea and man, they are party hardy. Uh, In fact, if you go back up and let me just read verses 20 and 21. And Miriam the prophetess, Aaron's sister, took the timbrel in her hand. And all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dancing. And Miriam answered them, sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and his rider he has hurled into the sea. Oh, what a time that was. A high time because God had just delivered them miraculously through the Red Sea and destroyed all of their enemies. And now they they were on the other side and uh, they were on their way. That they, they were on their way to the promised land, riding high, singing praises with high hopes of what the days would soon bring. And then we read in verse 22 that Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days into the wilderness and and found no water. Here the, the, the people of God have just been delivered by water. They just came through water. They were just baptized in the sea. They just came through the water, and now they are being tested by water by a lack of water, for they had nothing to drink. Now oftentimes we look back at these people and we scoff at them for their mumbling and their groaning and their complaining, but I tell you, to go three days without water is a long time. To go three hours when you are thirsty is a long time, and three days of thirst is a huge test when you're walking in the desert. I mean, I I, I can't imagine what kind of a test this is to go three days and be so parched and just to want to drink. And what a lesson this is because this does tell us that even after deliverance from our bondage, that life and the Christian life will test you. All of life will test you. The Christian life will test you. And might I say clearly that our God will test you. God will test us early and he will test us often. As soon as we come through the waters, we might find ourselves thirsty. As soon as our Lord was baptized, the spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He tests us early and he tests us often. And he will test us with our, with our thirst, with our cravings. Sometimes, I mean, they're, they're good cravings, are they not? Might I say that what we crave the most will likely be our biggest test. Whatever it is, whatever it is that you thirst for, That is what you will be tested with. And thirst is a powerful quest. Oh, to be driven by thirst. And it is a powerful test of an individual when your cravings take over. 
And oh, just to get some relief for this thirst. In fact, let me just read uh, Exodus, excuse me, Isaiah chapter 30, uh, the first part of verse number 20. Uh, Isaiah 30 and verse 20, he says, although the Lord has given you the bread of privation and the water of oppression. Well, he, the Lord does test us with food and with drink. The bread of privation and the water of oppression. And our Lord did this early and he did it often with the people as soon as he brought them through the sea. In fact, he did it throughout their 40 years in the wilderness. We read in Deuteronomy chapter number 8. Uh, listen to a couple of these verses. Uh, Deuteronomy 8 uh, verse number 3. And he says, he humbled you when he let you be hungry. And he fed you with manna, which you did not know, and nor did your fathers know, that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. And then verse 16 of the same chapter, in the wilderness he fed you with manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you, and that he might test you. To, go, to do good for you in the end. You see, oftentimes God does give us hunger and he does give us a thirst to teach us what is best. He gives us hunger to know what is better. And here the people of Israel have just come out of a great deliverance through the water and now they're tested by water. And so, dear child of God, do not be surprised if you are thirsty on your journey to eternity. You will be thirsty. God will give you a thirst to teach us some things and to show us some things about our thirst and about the only place that our thirst can truly be quenched. And so there is a dry quest for the people of God. They are thirsty for something. And then they have not only this dry quest, but they have a taste test. After three days, imagine, if, you know, the big party had gone on. They, they, they come out from the Red Sea and they're singing and they're dancing and they're going. And man, we're, we're on our way to the promised land and I, I'm sure it was great. But, but after three days of, of being parched, I, it's like, oh, well, that kind of puts a damper on the party. But then they see something in the distance. They, they spot something. Oh, there it is. They, they, they spot their promised relief. Oh, there it is. A place I can get my thirst quenched. Oh, how happy I imagine they were when they found the waters of Mara. Imagine the great congregation after panting three days through the desert and to look out and to see an oasis. Just to, to see a place where there was water. Oh, how happy they were at the sight of Mara. What a joy to see a solution to their thirsty problem at the waters of Mara. But oh, how disappointed. Oh, how disappointed it was when they finally run up and they, they get down and they just take a little drink. And when they tasted the water and it was bitter. Oh, to to be so thirsty and to be so hopeful that this is gonna quench it and to bend down and to put it to your lips and it to be bitter and undrinkable. Now Mara was not a mirage. It wasn't just something they were hoping for that wasn't really there, it was not a mirage, but it sure wasn't what it promised. 
I mean, it, it sure looked a lot better than it was. Uh, it was real water, but it was really disappointing water. You ever found that in life? Boy, it was real water, but boy, it's really disappointing water. Uh, Mara was bitter water. They named the place Mara because it means bitter. A, a, a bitter place. And I think there's a great lesson in this because, you know, there is a bitterness that is embedded into this sin-stained life. There is a bitterness that is embedded into this sin-stained world. And we see it all the time. Some are mirages and some are real. But not all that glitters is gold, is it? Boy, there's a lot of fool's gold out in this world. And not all drinks can quench a thirsty soul. There is an innate emptiness in everything within this existence. We are constantly thirsty. Constantly yearning and craving for a relief, for our thirst, for our cravings. And some last a little bit and some is just not even there at all and some is just full of bitterness. But there's a taste test in life. When God tests us with thirst and he gives us a taste test. Oh, there it is. And you think this, this has got to be it. But the taste test in life tells us that our thirst can never be fully quenched down here. It just can't. No way. Now, sin always had a, has a bitter end in it. The forbidden fruit always goes foul very, very fast. And the pleasure of sin never lasts. I mean, that, that, that is true. And we have all experienced that. But even in the good things in life, even in our earthly blessings in life, that those things are just temporal at best. It just quenches us for a little bit. It doesn't last. There is no eternal quenching of what we are thirsting for. And this is something that we all know. We all experience it. We have lived it. And I imagine that all of us here, if we could, we could stand up and give testimony to the Mara of life. Oh, that's it. That's going to quench the thirst. We have all tasted of the bitter waters and tasted of it with such high hopes that it would be sweet, that it would, be, that it would quench us, and we wouldn't thirst again. But all of us are still thirsty. And we walk away with a bitter taste in our mouths, all just a, a little bit empty, an empty taste for a dying thirst. You see, the taste test of life tells us that there is something terribly wrong down here. It's as I tell my kids, it's R-O-N-G wrong. You know, it's wrong and it's spelled wrong. And the taste test of life tells us there's a lot of Maras in life and they just don't quench our thirst. There's a dry quest in life. Uh, there's also a taste test in life. But here we see the gospel in Exodus 15 because there is a, a sweet tree of rest in life. Look again, verses 24 and 25. And so the people grumbled at Moses saying, what shall we drink? And then he cried out to the Lord and the Lord showed him a tree and he threw it into the waters and the waters became, became sweet. Um, the people were given to complaining, to murmuring, to grumbling. Uh, I don't blame them. Uh, I would be right there with them. Uh, they complained, wanting their thirst quenched. They cried out to Moses, what are we going to drink? Three days without water, and you're probably almost dead, I imagine. 
you know, with what little they, they, they had, that they, they, they are com- complaining and, and coming to Moses. And then Moses goes to prayer and he, he cries out to God and God sh- shows him a tree. A tree in the oasis? I, 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 I don't know if it was an old rugged tree or what it was, but he, he shows him the tree and he just says, throw it in the water. In verse 25, he cries out to the Lord and the Lord shows him a tree and he threw it into the waters and the waters became sweet. And there he made for them a statute and a re- regulation and there he tested them. Oh, and this such beautiful gospel account in Exodus. In the gospel of Exodus, I don't think it's a stretch to see in this tree an account of the cross. Is not this a foretaste of the glory divine? A tree that makes the bitter things sweet. Can I say that the cross can make the bitter water of life sweet. The cross, does it fix Mara? But it changed, the cross changes Mara into something sweet. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away and it was there by faith that I received my sight. And oh, I am happy all the day. You know, one of the the beautiful things we are reminded of in this supper, that, 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 that we are reminded that one of the beauties of our Lord's redemption is a repurposing of our own corruption, a repurposing of our bitterness in life. God does not change our evil into good. He does not change evil into good, but he does work all things into good because God causes all things to work together for the good of those that love him or are called according to his purpose. And might I say that even the Mara of life, even the bitterness of our life, even the sin of our life, God redeems and repurposes for our good. We can come to this supper and be reminded that God even uses our sin to sanctify us. Because where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. And he throws a tree, the old rugged tree, into the bitter waters of Mara, and he makes them sweet. I tell you, the cross can redeem you as a person, and it can even repurpose your corruption, because that's what he does in redemption. And that is something this supper tells us today, the cross can make the bitter water sweet. And can I remind us that that only Jesus Christ can quench our thirst. We we all feel it. We feel it every day. And whether it's, you know, thirst for drink or just the thirst and the cravings of life, we, hey, it rules our life, right? Our cravings, our thirst, our desires, but only Jesus Christ can quench our thirst. You remember the account in John chapter 4 where Jesus encountered a woman at the well. I'd say she's a pretty thirsty woman. She was there to get a drink. Uh, she had also been married, I think, five times. She was shacked up with the dude she was with then. Oh, she, she, was, she was thirsty in more ways than one. Looking for life to be quenched. And Jesus goes before this thirsty woman and says, hey, if, if, if you, you drink from this well, you, you're going to be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the waters that I give them, you, you won't be thirsty anymore. It, it'll be a well of, of living water 
within you. In fact, later on in John, in John uh, chapter 7 and verse number 37, at a great feast, Jesus stands up in a loud voice and he says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. I will give you water for which you will never thirst again. What an amazing declaration. You mean there's a place that our cravings, our desires, our thirst can be satiated and satisfied? I mean, that, that is mind boggling to people's lives we revolve around trying to keep ahead of our appetites and our thirst and our cravings. In the Gospel of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 55, we read, Isaiah 55, Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages of what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. Oh, what a great lesson in this. That when we are parched in life, when we are thirsty in life, when, when we are so parched, only a person can quench our thirst. And there is only one person that can quench our thirst. And that is the blessed Lord Jesus Christ, the God Son who came as a man and gave his life for us. His body is real food and his blood is real drink. And he says, come, eat, drink, and be satisfied for all eternity. As we get ready for this sacred meal, can I remind us all that this supper is a tangible gospel. So, 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 so much of our, of our faith is by, by words. I mean, God has given words. That, that, that is the, the, the main part. But but do you know God, ha God has given us some tangible expressions of our faith? Something we can kind of just reach out and lay hold of. And this supper is a tangible gospel, a tangible expression of the gospel. It is true that we walk by faith and not by sight. We generally do not see the gospel uh, because we live by faith. But you know God is so gracious to us. He's given us some eyes. Um, and in this supper, we get to see the gospel. We, we, we get to see a picture of the gospel. We actually get to look at it and, and see it. Not only see it, but we get to, to touch the gospel. Oh, I, I love the, the, the first part of 1 John where, where John is, is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ and he says, our eyes have seen him and our ears, I mean, our, our hands have handled him, we've touched him. We, and, and here we, we get a little foretaste of, of getting to see him. Just a little foretaste of, of getting to touch the gospel, of getting to, to smell the gospel, of getting to to taste the gospel. I, I mentioned earlier Deaf Church, Oklahoma. A group of believers here in our own city gathered together today. And as they gather together, they, they don't have the privilege in life that we all have to be able to hear the gospel. Oh, what a, what a blessed thing to, to hear the good news through the ear gate. 
They can't hear the gospel, but they can see the gospel. I, I just think of Danny Bice and he's signing the gospel to the people he has charge of and they can see it and believe it. And can I remind us today of us, a bunch of hearing people, that today in the supper, we get to see it. The supper is sign language for our five senses. And and it is a tangible expression of the gospel that is dramatically displayed before just a little bit of taste just a little bit of touch, just a little bit of smell, just a little bit of, of sight. Not, not, it's just pointing to something. It's reminding us of something. Something that will be a full-blown reality in eternity. And so as we get ready for this a supper and as the deacons come and I get ready to uncover uh, the elements. Let us taste and see that the Lord is good. In fact, there was a, a church we used to go to, and when we would have the Lord's Supper, the, the, the pastor, they would have kind of a, a cracker element, and he would, he would break it. And with the microphone, you could hear it crack and crumble. And why? I mean, it was just like I, I could almost hear our Lord's body breaking. Well, you know, today in our, in our bread, we, we've got some good bread here today. And we've got a couple of different ways we can take, but, but with our bread, we can taste and see that the Lord is good. And I, I hope you know that this day. As we get ready to partake, I do want to remind us that this is an, an open communion. We uh, practice that here, here which uh, simply means that this supper is open to any genuine believer. You do not have to be a member of this local body of believers, but if you are a, a baptized follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, your hope is in Him and in Him alone. You are clinging to only Jesus and His blood has cleansed you from every sin. Then you are free to partake of this symbol of his work in your behalf. It is open to any believer. Uh, but let me just remind us that it is only open for believers. Uh, this is called the Lord's Supper. It is his supper. It belongs to him, but it is only for the Lord's people. Uh, if you are an unbeliever today, you're, you are trusting in yourself, you are trusting in something else, or you are trusting in Christ plus something else, this supper is not for you. Uh, there are no garnishments in this supper. It is Christ and Christ alone, as we sang uh, earlier. And so, so this supper is only for believers to partake. But, but even as I say that, uh, there is a dramatic invitation embedded within this supper. Because what is portrayed before you is, is kind of a, a drama of faith. Almost as though you could reach out and lay hold of Jesus Christ. That you could take hold of the manna from heaven, the true bread that comes down from heaven, and you can... Have his body that was broken for you. It's almost as if, if you could just reach out and, and lay hold and partake of his blood that was shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. And so if you are here today and you are unredeemed, let me remind you that you can be redeemed. Let this supper remind you that if you reach out by faith and you lay hold of Christ, you will be saved because he is the Savior and he will quench your thirst. But let me also remind us that we are, even as believers, we're to examine ourselves, to prepare ourselves to partake of this supper so we do not take of it in an unworthy manner. And in my thinking, 
It's when we know we're unworthy that makes us worthy to partake of this supper. But examine yourself before you partake. It, it is a solemn supper, but it is a celebratory supper. I, I, I'm not a tambourine guy, but I tell you, if Miriam can get the tambourine out and do a jig and dance, this is a time for dancing, for celebrating, for singing, for rejoicing. Because Christ has made our bitter waters sweet. And if you know that, rejoice in this supper. So men come on and uncover the elements. Uh, there are some elements here in the front as well as uh, in the back. You can go out of whichever is nearest or whichever uh, you want to. Uh, I do believe we have options as we've had uh, for the last uh, while. We've got the, the, the prepackaged uh, juice and uh, bread uh, in these prepackaged units if you would prefer that. But we also have individual uh, individual elements. And so I'm going to ask one of uh, the deacons just to give a, a prayer uh, of blessing over the elements. And then after that, you can come and you can uh, get the, uh, pick up the bread as well as the cup, uh, go back to your uh, seat, and then we will wait, and then we will partake uh, together on my cue. So one of you want to th return thanks for the Lord, we come to you humbling ourselves because of what you've done for us. You gave up your body, your blood, but you did it willingly. But you are alive, you rose. We thank you so much, Lord, for this ordinance that you have established for the Lord's Supper as remembering you today and what, what the meaning of this is for the bread, the broken body, for the juice, the blood that you shed. May we all come to know you more today for what you've done. Because it's in Christ's name that we pray these things. Amen. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word. Just to rest upon his promise. Just to know the saith the Lord. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to trust his cleansing blood. Just in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing, cleansing flood. Yes, tis sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to cease, just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. I'm so glad I've learned to trust him. Precious Jesus, save your friend. And I know that he is with me, will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove <laughs> Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace, trust him more. Well, I hope you trust him this day, and as we get ready to partake of the bread, we are reminded that the great God who made us made himself like us. That the eternal God came veiled in human flesh and he, he took on a body formed in the, in the womb of his 
mother, the Virgin Mary. And, and he was just like us, flesh and bone, with all the same cravings, all the same temptations, tempted in every way that we are, yet without sin. And he bore our sins in his body on the tree. His body was broken so we could be mended. The rugged cross was thrown into the bitter waters so we could have some sweet bread. And so let's take a moment and return thanks for the body of our Lord. And he took the bread and he broke it and he gave it to them. And he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. As we get ready to partake of the cup, could I ask one of the deacons to return thanks for the, for the cup, for the blood? Thank you, Lord, for your shed blood. For this cup represents the blood that you gave each one of us to wash our sins away, to help us live a perfect life. Thank you for us. the forgiveness that you've given to us that we so do not deserve because of Christ and his love for us. May this blood, this juice that represents your blood wash away our sins as you forgive us. Thank you so much. In Christ's name we pray. As we get ready to drink, we are reminded by this that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins and that it was not with perishable things like silver and gold that we were redeemed from our empty way of life handed down to us for our forefathers, uh, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without spot or blemish. And so just take a moment and then I will cue us to drink together. And he took the cup and he gave it to them and he said, drink from it all of you for this is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we thank you of your, of your love that you had for us. You did not leave us in your sin, but you gave your only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We thank you for it, and we thirst for that day that we will partake of this meal with you in eternity, and all of our cravings will be gone. Amen and amen. Well, as we get ready to close the service, we will do so as we traditionally do, and you will stand, and we will be dismissed by singing, Bless Be the Tie That Binds. Bless Be the Tie That Binds.
are dismissed. Uh, come back tonight, six, uh, six o'clock. We'll talk about evangelism and missions.